Hey folks, welcome to Don't Take Out Your Phone. Had a really cool chat with Leon Walker today. Uh, we heard about his journey from Manchester to London, which is a pretty hard journey to make. And uh, the various challenges he's faced uh, entering into the London insurance market. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, what we can do to increase diversity and level the playing field. Um, so making sure that people have uh, a quality of opportunity and there are no obstacles in the way. So yeah, it was really good. I uh, hope you enjoy it. Hey, it's Lewis. Welcome to the podcast. Enjoy our conversations anytime, anywhere. Thank you, Liam, for joining me. Thanks for having me. Pleasure, pleasure. So Josh Breckenfeld introduced us. We should mention him. Good old Josh. Yeah, I haven't had him on the podcast yet. Good old Josh. Good just, old just Josh. Just to re- highlight that point. I think he's older than both of us. He's definitely old. Yeah. And uh, so he arranged a little gin tasting that we went to, which mm-hmm. is cool. And then I saw you talk at Dive In Fest, right. which was really good. So I thought I'd get you on. Oh, thank cool. you very much for having me. Pleasure. Thanks for joining us. So what's your story? How'd you come down from Manchester? Oh, uh, coal mining. <laughs> no, I'm not joking. Um, yeah, definitely football. Um, so I I started my career. I studied law first um, because I wanted to be in LA law. I think for, <laughs> for and suits, but suits wasn't available yet. I still thought I was Harvey Specter. <laughs> and um, my I think for a few days I was called Donovan before Leon because my mum was obsessed with Don Johnson so all of so so all of these American things had had an impact on my life and I thought law was the way to go because I loved arguing you didn't copy their accent I didn't copy their accent I couldn't ever get rid of my Mancunian accent and which is why I got a D in German (laughs) and um, effectively I I went into law but I didn't enjoy it as much as I did in theory when I was in practice so I was a paralegal, I worked for a number of firms, um, the last one being a sports law firm, which, oh, which cool. you know, I was in the meetings where um, Carlos Tevez was signing for Man United from West Ham and, and trying to draft new rules from, or trying to look at the differences between uh, years of FA football rules, thinking this is not LA law, this is <laughs> not suits, this is not what I thought. The sports are sexy part of law. It, it, that's what I thought. Um, and, and honestly, I thought to myself, I'm going to get out of law and um, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Okay. And I thought I'd been trained to kind of read contracts and I had pretty good attention to detail. So I went into a recruiter's office and they sent me to an insurance broker. Cool. Was this up in Manchester? Up so? in Manchester, yeah. yeah. They sent me to an insurance broker and I went for a compliance role at a, at a broker. Mm-hmm. And I sat in front of the CEO, very similar to as we're sat now. And um, he's like, what, you'll hate compliance. What about broking? I had no idea about broking. And he says, um, yeah, but you'll be good at it. And I thought, oh God, I'm on The Apprentice. I need to stick, <laughs> I need to stand my ground. I need to be yeah. very focused. So every time he said broking, I said compliance, broking, compliance. And he said, right, I'm going to stop you there. I'm going to give you a job in my broking business uh, in real estate. So I started out real estate broking and... You know, we had massive clients like Irvin Seller, who was behind the Shard, and oh, nice. one of my biggest clients had a thousand residential properties in wow. London. So you think about some of the scale, um, some of the portfolios we worked on, um, like Co- where Cot d'Argent is, one yeah, poultry yeah, building. Yeah. <clears throat> I'd never seen that, but we insured it up in Manchester. All right. um, so I kind of started out in the market that way. Fine. Um, worked in sales roles. Um, corporate development type okay. roles where I'd be traveling from Manchester to Scotland in a car. I think I did that. I, I think I drove to Glasgow three days after my driving test. It was the oh, fr- most frightening so experience of my sales. life. Oh, it was, I mean, yeah, I had nightmares about falling asleep at the <laughs> wheel for months. And um, after a couple of years, I, I realized that the insurance world was kind of where I wanted to be yeah. in terms of the foundations of what you can get. Um, were very different to law. Law, I, I left because I was 10 years away from getting client contact. On yeah, my second day in a broker, I went out to see a client and that ratified for me why I was making the move. And um, one of the interesting things is in my second year, my last 
broken firm in Manchester, I ruptured my patella tendon playing football. Ouch. Um, so for anyone that's scream, squeamish, effectively my kneecap was in my thigh. And I was off work for a couple of months and watching Bloomberg every day and and looking at the TV thinking the centre of the insurance world doesn't overlook Salford Chippy. <laughs> I think there's more to it than this. Football career finished by then? Oh, absolutely. My, my chances of playing for Man United ended probably when I was seven. <laughs> But but I dragged it out. You're gonna play for Man City at that time. Oh, isn't it? never, never. You can. I'm from Stratford. You can't even wear blue in Stratford. And, and honestly, I sort of sat there thinking, I have to get to London. How am I gonna do it? So I applied. Just because more opportunities. More opportunity. It seemed like the centre of the universe in, in terms of what I wanted to do. And if you were yeah. going to do insurance, come to the city yeah, yeah. and do it here. Um, and it was actually quite a stretch to go from Manchester to New York or Dubai or wherever. You have to have done your grounding in London. Yeah. Now, so I, I got a role at Willis, um, working in the heart of the city. Uh, it was a carrier management role, and I was quite tactical about why I did that. Um, and that was because it, it, it spanned the whole business. So okay. I was talking about aviation one day and fine art another, and energy, and, and obviously you don't do this in Manchester. So yeah. for me, it was a steep learning curve. And, and the transition to like living in London? Um, living in London was okay. Um, one of my uncles has lived here okay. for a long time, so yeah. I came here every summer as a kid. Um, but I think working in London was very different. Because one, I thought it would be... I was one of three black people that I ever saw in the market in Manchester. And I came to London because I thought it would be more diverse. Yeah. Or one of the reasons I thought it would be more diverse. And... When I started at Willis, and maybe this was just where I was at the time, um, there was very few, and, and, and actually I saw more people that worked in the kitchens and the catering and the cleaning and the security that were of, of ethnic minorities than, than I saw in the office, and I thought that was very strange. Weird. But didn't you, did you find London just as a whole very diverse? Yeah, but London's in fiefdoms. London's, London isn't you're right. You're London, right. Yeah. London, you know, like East London resonates with me more because that's a bit like Manchester. It's a bit grittier and it's got a bit of an edge. Yeah. yeah. And and Mancunians have that edge. Like look at the Gallagher brothers. They seem yeah, to yeah. have an edge. Yeah, definitely. Um, and we all want to be either the Gallagher brothers or David Beckham in his heyday. Um, he was some, from Essex. It, yeah, but he was <laughs> he when he, he was adopted son of Manchester <laughs> and, and and came a king of Manchester, and and effectively. When I got here, I thought everyone kind of sticks to their group, which was really quite weird. I mean, group as in like where you live. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, like, like you know, you had people that I saw a lot of pinky rings. Never seen those before. In Manchester. Um, yeah, I'm not a fan of the pinky ring. That that was new. That was that was a new thing. Um, <laughs> as, and, and then of course in the city you have this sort of crashing together of of sort of Eton and Essex. Yeah. And, and, and some army. Correct. Yeah. And, and what's fascinating here is, you know, boarding school is massive, as is army. But where I'd come from, you only went to army or boarding school if you were really naughty. <laughs> so it was very... Mum sent you off to boarding yeah, school. Yeah, because they couldn't control yeah. you. Whereas, yeah, yeah. whereas here, maybe the standard's much higher. So I was meeting people from different backgrounds and actually that, be, that part of that diversity is something that I loved. Yeah. But I still felt quite lonely. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it took a long time to find people that look like me um, but I replaced that with people that thought like me and I think that's where my view of what diversity has shifted from what people look like to what people think like and how yeah, they definitely. act and what their values yeah. um, so whilst it was a bit of a shock it was transformational in terms of how I thought about the yeah. world yeah um, but it was yeah I, I think yeah, strange. I, I got my ass kicked for the first couple of years in London because I didn't understand hierarchy I didn't understand structure and ego and I didn't understand that that people needed to be made to feel important office politics yeah, I guess yeah yeah, yeah. because yeah. I'd worked in roles where yeah, the, the bottom line was the driver so how much do you produce how much do you add to the company and nothing else mattered so when I came here and it became very political the size of the companies grew etc yeah, yeah I thought you know, I need to kind of step my game up, and it took it, that learning curve was was steep. You, you, you did go to a massive firm, d- yeah, and, and that does make a big difference, I think. Yeah, I mean, Willis must have been 
infinitely bigger than, than them. Well, well, I mean, I worked for JLT in Manchester, but I worked for a part of JLT which was 30 people right. with 400 people around us that were uh, employee benefits, so ex Mercer people. Yeah. So effectively, I'd only ever worked for small companies, really. Whilst I had a big name, I'd only ever yeah. worked for small companies. Um, even from the property investor broker I worked for, that was 56 people when I left. So coming to Willis, where I was one of 19,000 at the time, was just mind blowing. Crazy. And did you actually, did you fa have you faced any discrimination? Um, so just, yes, uh, yes. And I think given, b b before I touch on kind of my own experience, yeah. I think given what's going on in the world, given what's the, some of the challenges we have, um, I think 2016 was probably one of the worst years of m my life because every day I'd turn on the news there was a black person being um, arrested or murdered or shot at by police or choked out like Mike Brown was choked out. This is the US, this is all US This stuff. is US, yeah. but it was published on BBC News yeah, 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 and all absolutely. these things and yeah. News at 10 and all of that, News Night, Channel 4. and. It was hard because, frankly, it would be remiss of me to say that all of this didn't have a impact on the way people viewed us right, globally. Right. And turning those, seeing that every day, it wasn't that it was happening, it was that it was being filmed and it became news. And news is more like entertainment these days. Just get, yeah. So it was just a constant barrage. And, and I thought, well, of course, if you, if you, Say you're a recruitment person in a in a company, or you're a CEO and you get a CV, and it's a black person or a Muslim person. If your image of those people is only ever derived because because your circle doesn't include those people, it's only derived from what you see on the news. Then of course you're gonna. It's not unconscious. You just it's you'd conscious. rather not have that. Yeah, yeah. You'd rather yeah. not have that around you. So. I'd be, it'd be remiss of me to say that hasn't affected me at some stage in my life. Yeah. As it relates to my own experience of discrimination, um, to give you a bit of background, where I grew up, there was only two black families on the council estate I grew up on. And um, effectively, when we moved in, my mum and dad went to the local pub and, and they were quite young. So um, my mum had me when she was quite young and they went to the local pub and everyone stopped drinking until they left. Really? Yeah. And what year was this? Oh, uh, this was 87, 8. Crazy. So for, for, for me, it was fascinating growing up in that environment because my parents' view was, we don't belong here. But all of the kids of these people became my best friends. So... There was so many times where we were, I'd be in fights when I was younger or, you know, trying to trying to defend. You, you were always on the back foot. Yeah. Um, but and they were not, I mean, so, so the kids and your peers, you, you experienced like no discrimination or racism. So, so, or so, so it was a mixture. Right, right. Because right, whilst if anyone attacked me from the outside, I would always have the protection of these people who just yeah, yeah. grew up with me. Yeah, yeah. I often would get into fights within my own group because they would come and repeat some of the things that they'd hear from their parents. Oh, right, right. So there's a case of, you know, I mean, the worst ethnic, the worst d discriminatory experience I've had is I was playing in an, an, uh, a football match in a certain part of Manchester. Uh, I was quite good at football, to be fair, and um, a lot of people came to watch it. And one of the spectators had torn a Coke can in half and then slice the ear of one of the players on our team. Jesus. While he was taking a throw in. So it was quite a rough, rough name. And that was a racial, uh, racial yeah. attack. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, and, but what was fascinating was one of the parents who happened to be a white guy shouted at me and called me an albino, which I thought was quite funny at the albino. time. Because, I, <laughs> because clearly he didn't understand what an albino was. So I thought, if that's the worst racial experience I'm going to have in my life, publicly, directly, I think I'll take it. Yeah, yeah. I think I can move on from that. Crazy. Very, Crazy. Very. And then, and then moving to London and working in insurance where yeah. it's not particularly diverse. Mm -hmm. 
And have you experienced anything, or how have you found your, your journey, kind of um, making your way in, uh, in your career? And I think it's an interesting point here, because the London market isn't very diverse, and I think working in, or getting closer to diversity and inclusion as an agenda, people are, the market feels like it has diversity fatigue, almost yeah. like they, review, they view it as be, a message being rammed down their throat, which is really frustrating because if you're on the other side of that, you feel that progress has been very slow, so you're not yeah. really seeing any change. Yeah. And yeah. when people tell you they have diversity fatigue, it suggests that they don't want to change. Right, right. Um, so Do I, you think that's true? Or? I can only go off the evidence, yeah, right? Yeah, no, we've got, yeah, yeah. you know, t take insurance aside, we've yeah. got more CEOs in the FTSE 100 called David than we do from a black and ethnic minority background. Crazy. Right. Yeah. yeah. So what, what? how can we argue with the numbers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I also think quite radically that there are two sides to this. There's there's, there's a, a fence almost. Yeah. And I think on, on the side of the fence of the establishment, and the establishment tends to be middle age or middle class white men, on the side of the establishment, if I sit with them, I feel like diversity and inclusion is presented as a zero sum game. In what way? Almost that for 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 it to become more diverse, I have to lose something from my table. So you're taking food off my table to to then feed everybody else. Right, right. And it feels like I'm constantly under attack. And I don't think diversity and inclusion is is meant to come across that way because yeah, it's yeah. supposed to be inclusive by Abs definition absolutely, absolutely and at the moment it feels like we attack this person and you know we've all run teams and set up teams in the past you don't go in and sack your most experienced person you build around that person some of yeah some of the some of the the diversity and inclusion um initiatives are, are not done well correct yeah and and you can see how that will all happen I mean, even so far as some, some, some obviously I run a headhunting firm, mm -hmm. um, some clients have asked specifically, and this is on gender, mm -hmm. but 50% has to be a uh, female, 50% has to be male, mm -hmm. which, which again, it, it creates big problems, right? Because ultimately, really being inclusive, who cares where people have come from, what they look like, mm -hmm. are they male or female? I mean, who cares, right? I, 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 I literally, I, I don't care. Yep. Um, but maybe, as my colleague Eddie Oda was saying, young people, I'm classing myself as young, <laughs> even though I'm like keep, 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 Yeah, keep pulling uh, those strings. Young, young people are much more optimistic. Correct. So I, I'd love to think, and I do believe, that you know, my social circle, my peers aren't racist, homophobe, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but the reality in the world is probably a bit different. Oh, completely, um, C completely, and, and, and I echo that. Um, but I think you know, you're sat on that side of the fence. You're thinking, I'm under attack here, and I don't want to. Why would I? If you're going to attack me and then say, actually, do you want to come and be part of the solution? I'm probably going to say no. Yeah, it's not a good way to. Right. Yeah. So then, if I go to the other side of the fence where I sit, uh, as a as a young black uh, person with. Afro-Caribbean heritage with a manke very strong Mancunian accent, which is probably coming through today. Um, I look at it and say, we have significant challenges. Um, and one of those is that insurance is not something that we pick, typically. Yeah. Because in our communities, and whether you're black or Asian or, or, or any of these, in our communities, we look for the ones that we can see so, for instance, I always say that my grandparents came here to get a job, like any job, get on the yeah. ladder. Um, my mum's generation had to get a job that you could point to in the community. Yeah. yeah. So gas board, council, um, health authority. It had to be something that you could point to. Yeah. Postman, you had to be able to see it. Yeah. And, and then they hit the glass ceiling. Um, so my generation's job is to become senior in, the, in those companies that they couldn't become senior in, right? That's my so that's my historical responsibility to my culture. I see. Yeah, yeah. So then the generation after me, so my kids or the people that I mentor at the moment, um, their job is to start their own businesses. Because then the generation after them is on equal parity. They can go in and do the gas board. They can go in and be a labourer. They can go in and do the the CEO job. They can go in and be the entrepreneur. They have as much choice as anyone else, and it will take five generations to do that. Five, yeah, wow. 
and I'm sort of three down. I'm yeah. three in the line, so we're not far off, but we're still a long way away from where we want to be. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was so the same with my, my family. Both my yeah. parents are immigrants. One dad's from Egypt, one's from South Africa. Um, my mum had a different upbringing. I grew up in apartheid South Africa. My dad was chucked out of Egypt for being Jewish and came wow. here and the whole thing. So it's, it's not, not too dissimilar. Um, but also in, the Ju in Jewish culture, uh, a lot of the parents push the kids into being an accountant and being Correct. a doctor. You know, and, and immigrants tend to want to uh, contribute to the society they've moved into. And, mm -hmm. and as you see, the, as the generations go on, they start to get more integrated and assimilated. And, My first yeah, I mean. broking job was in a Jewish real estate bro investor broker. And I learned everything I know about business from that firm because that was about us and the community and helping and yeah, yeah. teaching. And that's what I saw, I saw teaching. I didn't see, um, I didn't see challenge. I saw, how can I help you do this? Yeah. And everything I learned from business, from those, well, from, no, the, from those bosses. No, well, the key to leadership is thinking about servicing your employees. Correct. Teaching, education, if we all do better, mm -hmm. we all do better, right? Um, so having that mindset, not everyone has that mindset, but if we can get that instilled in people, mm -hmm. then I think we'll go a long way. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so um, what should we do? What should we do? What can we do to achieve equality of opportunity? Do you think? Well, I think, I mean, equality is a big question, right? I, I think equality is something that kind of starts outside the office. I think companies are, have a responsibility to set a framework where people feel that they can do their best and their best might be um, half as good as someone else, but it's still their best and they want to be able to do that. Um, you have to understand that some people come to work for just the paycheck and then they support their lifestyle with that. And Which is fine. And it's just yeah. fine. And then there's certain people, if you're like me or... Certainly, like when when Josh and I speak, you know, we're kind of pinking the brain, like trying to take over the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I think that you have to give room to those people as well, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but equality to me is something that touches politics, housing, economics, relationships, exposure, media, as I touched on before. Yeah, yeah. Um, equality is there. And companies kind of need to pressure media. Like I went to a talk with um, someone very senior at WPP, the biggest sort yeah. of advertising agency in the world. And I pressed that person as to how do you how do you allow these companies to position us in such a way from a black and ethnic minority background? How do you allow that to be the case where um, the only time we ever see any, anyone celebrated is if they're a sports person or if they're an entertainer? which is effectively the same because sports is entertainment yeah. these days. Where do you go and find the leaders and the owners and the developers? And why don't you celebrate them in the same way that you celebrate Steve Jobs or the same way you celebrate Richard Branson? And that person didn't really have an answer other than I can only work off the brief I'm given by the client. So <laughs> if the client is the company and yeah. the company's role is to then start to change narratives. now. I spoke at an event recently for, for the diving festival, as you as yeah. you saw, and I talked about the movie Black Panther. Yeah, and that was a seminal movie for for anyone from a, a, a certainly a black background. It's I think it's a twelve, and I went in there and I sat next to a six year old. Like it was <laughs> ridiculous. People needed it. They needed that that confidence boost. Maybe after twenty sixteen, I don't know. Yeah. Um, and the reason why I think that's important is not necessarily because well. In addition to the fact that you saw someone there that was a warrior as a woman and a, a scientist that was a young girl and, and the king was black and he had heritage and he relied on his ancestors and yeah. all these things that you get taught of in, 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 in when you come from a, a minority background to look for and reach on. Um, it was important because it made a billion dollars in a month. It's crazy, isn't it? It made a billion dollars in a month. And do you think that was important because of the role model aspect? I think it was important because every advertising agency realised that they could tap into that dollar that Jordan has been getting for years. Yeah. Michael Jordan <laughs> tapped into that dollar that, that black people will, certainly in America, 
will queue for days to get the next release, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And Black Panther tapped into that. So now when I pick up GQ or I pick up um, Esquire or any of the other fashion magazines that end up in my house because my fiance works for a fashion company, <laughs> um, all of those have diverse models in now. Yeah. And, yeah. and the fashion yeah, industry changed true. overnight yeah. well, because true. it went to get that dollar. Not because it had any moral obligation, not because it wanted to change the world, but because they realised that if you can put these people on the page, they will buy my clothes. So I was speaking at a school recently, I've become a, a school governor for awesome. a school in East London, and I was speaking at a school and I was talking about uh, labels like Trapstar and um, Puma and all these things that have now become cool in... in, in um, in, in, in black and ethnic minority communities and I asked the kids why do you think that is and they said oh well because it's cool and and um and supreme that was the other oh, label. Yeah, yeah. and it was why do you think that's cool and they said because Jay-Z wears it or because Beyonce wears it and I said no it's because you wear it it's because they know you will you will save up all of your money everything you have and you'll spend it on this item that's why it's cool and that's why they push it and you need to have a look at that from a frame of how powerful this message has become, how powerful these people are. And people don't like the term BAME, like I didn't like it at first. But then I realised that that just cemented all of these different parts of this question just into, uh, into one big group. And now we can say, right, what do we want to do about it? Yeah, but it's good. I mean, you've got, I think you need more role models. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's the sports stars, there's the musicians. Um, Kanye went to meet um, Donald <laughs> Trump. Kanye. <laughs> Kanye has had his hood pack revoked. <laughs> revoked. I tell you, he's had it revoked. Um, but, but no one that's got close to the Kardashians has come, well, come off well. So no, they've, 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 I mean, they've done that. You know, I mean, the sister's like was the quickest billionaire, exactly. um, you know, from Instagram because uh, her sister did a porn, uh, uh, I know. porn video. Crazy. Um, how is how is mum famous? There's, <laughs> there's a few memes about that. <laughs> yeah. um, but I think so. But, but back to kind of like non non like sports stars and musicians mm -hmm. and stuff. Um, certainly, we need more role models um, and more representative in, in, in these types of industries. Oh, for sure. But I mean, it's a challenge to get people to want to work in, like, let's say, insurance or financial services. Hundred percent. I think not only because their families don't do it, or they don't respect it. Like, like I said, my grandmother cried when she heard I worked in insurance. She thought I was knocking on everyone's door on the street. <laughs> I'm trying to explain to her I'm insuring. Uh, I think at the time we were looking at some of the early plans for the cheese grater. And she's like, what, you're going to be knocking on someone's door to ask them about a cheese grater? Like, it's very, very strange. I, I think, yeah, there's an attraction problem to the market. Yeah. And we need to at, work... At all levels? A hundred percent. I think we need to look at... I, I think if the average age of an active underwriter at Lloyds of London is 53, and, and I have to be careful because I don't want to be ageist, this is not an age thing, but if the average age of an active underwriter is that age, if I say I'm supportive of diversity and inclusion and focus on the grad scheme, yeah. then that means that by the time those people come through to challenge me for sen to challenge for senior jobs, I've already retired. Yeah. I'm out. I I'm supportive of it, but as long as I don't have to work for it. But there are, okay, so underwriting is an example where you have to have started young and worked your way up. But, you know, but there are a bunch of roles where you can hire someone from a different industry. 100%. Technology, data science, you know, all of these new kind of things that are coming through. But you typically don't see people hiring them. They still take people from similar firms, from rivals. Yeah. They're scared to make a bad hire. But then I, I push back on recruiters, and you can only go off the brief, right? Yeah. So what we so so what I, so what we do? We go and take a brief from a client. We go through all of our various questions and open up the spec and probe as to why they want certain skills and experience. And and it's always the same. So right. to start with, they're open to someone from outside the market. But in the end, and then you deliver that, that kind of diverse list, different mm -hmm. sectors and stuff. Because more, more, you know, like wider financial services is much more diverse than, right. than insurance, right? Yeah. So, you, so you can start to increase diversity in insurance if you start recruiting from different sectors. But in the end, um, they always end up 90% of the time going for someone from the insurance sector, from a rival. Um, 
A safer it's hire. safe. It's a safer hire, yeah. Well, if let's say you, know, you, you go down to kind of mid level or junior level, let's say, and you're asking a middle manager mm -hmm. to make a hire, if they make a bad hire because they've hired someone from Mercado or whatever other company, I mean, you know, their, their boss is going to be like, well, why didn't you just hire someone from, from one of our rivals? But, but how is it that a com uh, an organization or an industry that is designed around risk won't take any? Well, firstly, people like people like themselves, right? Now, so sector, whatever, whatever the, you know, the commonalities are. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're in a job for, and the average tenure in a job now is two and a half to three years, yeah. right? So you're in this job, you want to do well, you want to progress. You know, it's, you, why take a risk on someone that's, you know, left field? So, so that, not, and say maybe they're not empowered to do it. Yeah. Um, you know, it's been a different econ economic environment. You've got Brexit coming up. You know, just maybe people are in this mindset of let's just make a safe hire. Uh, it's like, you know, it's the 100% of the FTSE 100 years, the big four accounting firms. Yeah. I mean, yeah. they don't take it, you know. Well, it's like you never get fired for hiring McKinsey. That yeah. kind of it's thing. It's like a classic thing. So so I think there's a bit, for me, from my perspective, there's a bit of a, an issue around that. And, and we do, I do what I can because, for, I mean, for us, it's great to have a larger pool of people to source from. Right. You know, m much easier to find good people and diverse. And, but yeah, in the end, it's uh, it's often more often than not the insurance experience. It people. sounds like you're beating your head against a brick wall. Uh, probably, but you keep trying because right. I, I think I think ultimately it hasn't changed actually for a while. Right. I mean, for I mean, I've been recruiting in in insurance and wider financial services for like maybe 14, 15 years, and it's it's always the same conversation. It has been from the start. Sometimes they take a risk on someone. Most of the time, they don't. And, and you end up, you know, the same people moving around these, these jobs. So there's a, a few things there that you said that I want to just touch on. So first about taking a risk on someone. Um, that will have to happen f to change the demographic of the London market. Um, and there's a, there's a perception that it's easier to train Charlie from Charterhouse School than it is to train Jamal from Brixton, right? Like there's just a perception. Like I'm going to have to teach this person stuff to yeah. operate in this world. And some of that's true, but then most of it isn't. And I think because you don't experience that person in your circle, then you have no reference point, and again, other than what you see on the news. So that's, that's one. I think on that point, so just to, of course. On that point, I think, so if you look at the low socioeconomic backgrounds, mm -hmm. comprehensive schools and stuff, we can do, we can do a lot to, um, to work with kids in those, in those scenarios. Mm. Because if you want to be, let's say, you want to be an accountant or a scientist or investment banker, your choice of GCC starts at 14 years old. Yeah. Um, and mostly people in that, in that, in, in that uh, part of society do worse at GCCs, don't get the GCCs to the right A-levels. If you don't do the right A-levels, you can never be a scientist. Or yeah. So companies in this, in this industry, just generally, can do a lot more work with schools at that level. So yeah. whoever it is from the local comprehensive school, uh, understands that hey, you can be an underwriter, or you can be an investment banker, or you can be a scientist. And, mm. yeah. The guy from the private school has the benefit of people coming in and talking to them about their jobs, yeah. about coming on work experiences, and so they really get a head start. So this equality of opportunity, I feel people miss out on from 13, 14. Oh, 100%. Like, it starts, at, I mean, there was a program on BBC about this, talking about the chance of someone from a black background becoming prime minister being in the many millions of percent because it was because of all these socio-economic yeah. challenges. Yeah. Um, and, and I don't want to divide the person from the public school. And I don't think that person should ever have to apologize for their background just because their parents have been successful or yeah, their yeah. grandparents have been successful. You can't apologize for that. No. But what you can do is recognize your own privilege. And, and privilege is very important. So. Now people talk a lot about white privilege because it's fashionable to do it. And I think that white privilege is, as I, I mean, my fiance is white, so we talk about this sort of stuff around our table because we have the additional challenge of, if we're blessed enough to do it, having a mixed race child. So we have to work as hard as media is to make sure that child feels like it belongs somewhere. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and belongs to us and feels equal part. But when we talk about white privilege, I say to her that, that's because the, the way it presents is that you only have to apologize for yourself as an individual. Whereas when I, have to, when I feel like I have to apologize, 
the way in which society is set up is as if I'm apologising for everybody. So people give you, because you're the only reference point for many people, they'll say, so why do black people do this? And as if you can answer for every black person. Or why do Jewish people do that? And you think, yeah. how, do I, how do I know? Like, if I said to her, why do white people do this? She's like, well, I can only answer for myself and that's okay. Yeah, yeah. But I think privilege is very important because whilst I can point at privilege in other people, I have to be humble enough to realise I have my own. So yeah. my privileges of just being a man or being born in the West or being born in the UK or the difference between even being born in Manchester versus other parts of the North. Absolutely. You yeah. know, all of these things. So you have to be, you have to, people have to be a little, have show a little bit more humility yeah. to then get this equality that you're looking for. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I guess as it relates to Jamal or my, my fictional, my fictional Brixton boy, or it relates to Charlie from Charles House, all they need to do is align an object around an objective. Because what happens in, in small companies versus big companies, in my experience is, in a small company, they're aligned around an objective and it doesn't matter where you come from, everyone's going for it. Yeah. When you get to a big company, it becomes more political. And that's where you start hiring your own image and wrap yourself, wrap people around you that you that you know are going to protect you. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, so there's an element of of kind of democratizing the objectives and saying, right, it doesn't really matter. I don't care where you come. To your point, yeah. I don't care where you come from. Male, female, age, LGBT, wheelchair, whatever you have, bring it because we're yeah. going to need it to get to this objective. Yeah. yeah. And and I think that. This, this, the city of London, um, one, needs to acknowledge some of its past as to how it's got what it's got, and two, needs to step out of the train tracks. It feels like people are saying, well, David was successful, so I'm going to follow David and I'm going to do exactly what he says, and then the person following the person following David does exactly what David does, and no one seems to innovate. But it's a tough change. on that, because if we think of that from the other perspective... Um, you know, if you're lucky enough to have uh, two parents who are successful doing a, a something, a career, mm -hmm. and, and you look to them as role models or other family members or people in society, if you don't have that, mm -hmm. then it's quite easy to just, you know, you, you don't know what's possible. Um, yeah. you, you, your goals are, are much shorter than they should be. Uh, honestly, you know, growing up where I grew up, that that was patently obvious. It was It was common that... Yeah. You know, I, I lived, I lived probably half a mile away from Man United's ground, and probably fifty or sixty meters away from Trafford Park, which had lots of factories, and that's where you were supposed to work, right? That's that that was absolutely where you were supposed to work. But so my grandparents came here in the sixties, and they definitely experienced racism. Um, and, you know, the the stories that our grandmother would tell about just going to the butchers and having to wait until the last white person was served. And you she could be in there for three hours because when she's the next person to be served, if someone came in, if someone came in then, she'd have to wait until they were served and, and all of these things. It's crazy. But my granddad um, was a tailor and he set the standard for our family. In what way? In every way. How he looked, how he presented how we talked, how we carried ourselves, what our aspirations were. I mean, he was he was quite big in the in the local community in terms of helping people from the Caribbean settle in the UK, give them jobs, okay. give them a suit, yeah. get them settled. And you look back at pictures of the 60s and the way that certainly black people dressed relative to this sort of um, Hollywood version of it now where sort of yeah, your, yeah. your pants around your ankles then it was suits and ties every yeah. day and my granddad wore a suit and tie every day well, he did come in in a suit and tie today looking smart well that's <laughs> and, and what's really interesting is that's because of my family standard yeah, yeah. that's got nothing to do with the city of London that's got nothing to do with what anyone tells me here that's our standard and we, and we don't let that standard drop and I have you know, I have seven uncles that I'm very proud of and I have my mum who is probably one of my heroes because they maintain that standard and then we all grow off the back of that. Like we, it didn't really, you could take, you could pick our family up and put us in any country and our, our values about 
hard work and graft and being presentable and articulate, hopefully, mm. and and focus around changing the community, that that is irrelevant as to where we are. Now, not everyone's as lucky as us. Yeah, yeah. You know, my granddad was a very strong character and he bred strong characters and I'm a strong character. They had a good family in you know, it. Co correct. And, and, you know, whilst I have a lot of the traits of many people, uh, you know, you come from a single parent background and all of these things, whilst I have many of the traits of those people, anyone I tell, anyone I mentor, and I mentor a few people, uh, mm -hmm. five people, um, I talk about you set your standard. So there is one thing in keeping um, with this podcast that, that I, I'll share. Yeah. So and I got it from Game of Thrones, actually. I got it. <laughs> so watching Game of Thrones, one of the big differences between, uh, we talked about the pinky ringers yeah. and, 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 and certainly people from my background is um, heritage. And if you, talk, if you watch Game of Thrones, they'll always say, this is a son of, and the son of, the son of, who yeah. is X. And what we lack is that. We don't have the people that have done it before I see, yeah. to let to go off, right? Yeah. Um, and so I started to think about what would be great is if I'd have been able to see or hear my granddad's experiences in his life so I could use them as a reference point. Absolutely. Yeah. So what I started to do was record um, like voice notes and I saved them into a Dropbox for my grandkids. Nice. Nice. So I can talk to them about being the first one that came to work in the city, and I can talk to them about um, office politics because we don't get taught that. I can get I talk to them about um, uh, management management of international relationships because we don't get taught that. I I I talk to to them about what it was like when I was preparing to propose, yeah. and and how uh -huh. it took me sort of seven years to figure out whether I wanted to get married at all. <laughs> at all and then as soon as I decided um, I decided on the Saturday I wanted to do it and then I proposed the following week like I wasn't there was no mess in there was just and do you rec and you record all, all of, of that wow how long have you done that for um, probably about 12 months love that love that so the aim it's like a time capsule yeah yeah and you pass that down and it was Game of Thrones that taught me that because these people just I know it's acting, but what they're acting is kind of art imitating life, right? So they're kind of saying, we know how to behave because our pair, our family behave this way. Yeah. So like yeah. Lannisters always pay their debts yeah, yeah. Or, or whatever yeah, it is. <laughs> so, and what we have in the in the BAME community is the ability now to draw a line in the sand based on all we've learned yeah. and say, right, this is, how we're, this is my family brand. It's great, you're just la layering. Yeah. It's brilliant. And do you think that's going to be the catalyst for real change i, th I think the, the catalyst because you were talking about yeah like i want more people in senior positions now i do and, and do you think this is gonna yeah yeah i i think you know there's there's a few things really i i think there's an element of um and i was reading recently about the end of slavery in the us and how for a few years the slaves do, did what was called walking around effectively and they would go into the bars and the restaurants that they weren't previously allowed into just to kind of show that they could do it yeah so they go and sit in the bar and you know think of it here go and sit in the land because you can and yeah. i never was able to before but now i can and now i'm here and i didn't have a job to support that and i didn't have a life to support that but i was here and i just want to show you that i can do it too yeah and i worry that within certainly our community, excuse me, <coughs> if we're still doing that. Like, I want to be senior at PwC because I wasn't able to do that before, and now I am. And you what might we get should, some of that, but... But what we should do is start our own. Absolutely. We, need, we don't yeah. lack role models. I, I, I challenge, yeah. I don't, we don't lack role models. We have role models. Some of them are, the, are role models that we don't deserve. Like, as so much as I love his music, Little Wayne is not my role model. <laughs> But or Kanye now, but old Kanye was because he was cool. But we lack owners, we lack leaders, we lack people that can shape the destiny of their own it's company. An entrepreneurial type. Yeah, we lack people that can can hire whoever they want. If I start a company, after talking the way I've been talking to you for the last twenty minutes, 
I can't then just allow it to become homogenous. I can't just allow it to become an all black company or an all female company. I have to mix it yeah, and I have the control in which to do that. And I think that's what we lack in our community. We don't lack role models. We lack owners. Yeah. They're all, they're all, yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right. So what can we do to make the interview processes fairer? If you think they're not fair. Ah, uh, well, Because that's the other. Yeah. Because there's I, a lot of talk about it, but uh, yeah, I mean, first thing, do you think it's a fair process now? Generally. I mean, you can only look at the result and the result in the London market, I walk around Lloyd's, um, everyone still has in their own image. And Is that because it's not fair or that just they have a lack of, of choice? Both. Right. So, I, so, no, it's not fair because everyone has in their own image. That, yeah. That's just the result. Yeah. Um, the, as I said before, on, on our side of the fence, we need to get the candidates interested in insurance. There's an attraction problem, yeah. and that's not, and, and and we can't kick the can down the road and just focus on grads. We need to try and get middle managers and allow you to bring in people from other parts Absolutely. of FS. Yeah. Um, so all of that matters. Um, but I also think that, you know, given my background, I'm going to be predisposed to hire someone from a working class background. That's a fact. How do you know they're from a working class background, though? Just talking to them. Talking, having the conversation, learning yeah, about their trying. experience and their challenge. Yeah. So I'm going to be predisposed to be looking yeah, for yeah. that, right? So as a result, you then change the environment. You don't change, like when a flower's broken, you don't change the leaves, you change the soil, you change the environment, right? Yeah. So instead of allowing me to just interview someone on my own, where I'm going to obviously favour the person from work as background, you put me in a room with other people on my panel that aren't going to look for that, aren't going to be turned on by that. Yeah, that's true. So that way you get a more balanced view. And you do, are you doing that at the moment? So that we're, we're pushing for um, multiple things. So I lead the Cultural Awareness Network at Lloyd's at the moment. Which is what? Um, so we've got um, representation goals. We've got goals around celebrating different cultures and Great. religions yeah. and ethnicities. Um, and we've got a, a committee together that's done a number of things, which, which I'll touch on in a second. Um, one of them is around diverse recruitment panels. And what we've done as a cultural awareness network, the committee itself, is we've done inclusive hiring training, all of us. And we are then offering ourselves out to the business as people that can go into an interview process and support the interviewer rather than the interviewee. Okay. Well, so well. I'm not really looking at you as a candidate yeah. I'm looking at the person interviewing you and making sure they're asking questions that are more inclusive than they would typically right, okay. so if I'm so if they were sat in with me for instance and I'm absolutely loving the fact this person's a Man United fan yeah. and letting that skew the fact that they have um, their experience could be put probed a little bit more yeah. or letting that skew the fact that just because they um, you know they've got the newest Jordans that I like and all these sorts of things they can give that person a nudge and sort of shape the push the interview to a slightly more balanced view. Yeah. So the verse recruitment panels is one. Blind CVs is another because again. Do you do blind CVs? So we're we're starting we're piloting it in in operations at the moment. Okay. At every level. Uh yeah. So we're we're piloting blind CVs because what tends to happen in interview process is the whole unconscious bias process starts with where have you come in from. Yeah. And classic you, question. Classic question. <laughs> because when you say, oh, I travel down from Manchester, then instantly I'm going to be your mate. Yeah. You might even just be able to put on a great Mancunian accent and I'm sold. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, so that's why we need the panel to go in hand yeah. in hand and with the plan that's unconscious, though. That's conscious. Conscious bias. Though. Well, I think more bias is conscious than unconscious. Yeah. I, don't, yeah. I don't think unconscious bias is, is enough. I think people focus on that and they think, you know, anything happens, they'll send you an unconscious bias training as if that ticks the box. Whereas actually, we need to just challenge your conscious biases and then allow you to talk about them. Yeah, that's true. Um, you know, we, we had a, an issue at Lloyd's where <clears throat> we did a, a Ramadanathon, right. which, allowed, which effectively we had um, a number of us fasted for Ramadan. Cool. And it sounds very altruistic. For the whole, for the whole month? Yeah. So it's, uh, well, so it sounded very altruistic, but... One of the Muslim guys at work bet me that I couldn't fast for a day. 
So I fasted for 12 days. <laughs> and the aim was to do a day in the first week, two days, three days, four days, until I got, got up to speed. And we launched a Ramadanathon with a talk from a scholar in Lloyd's. Oh. And we had, a, we had a poster that said, this is a Ramadanathon, pop in to understand a little bit more about it. Awesome. And then we had complaints because it was a day after the Manchester bombing. Right. And certain people in the market were of the view that we shouldn't be promoting Islam in Lloyd's building because of the Manchester bombing. And, of course, you know, there's, there's, I can't go too much more into it because there's obvious confidentiality yeah. challenges. But we, I wanted to speak to the person individually who had said the, who'd made the complaint. Yeah, definitely. Well, it was an anonymous complaint. Yeah. Uh-huh. I, wanted to, I wanted to, more than anything, because they have the right to make the complaint. No one has the right not to be offended. You can take, eff- you can take issue with being offended, yeah. but you don't have a, there's no God-given right not to be offended. Yeah. However, I wanted to understand why that person felt that. Right? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So, so it's the same with changing, not changing the leaf. Or, or the flower, you change the environment. So you take that person away and you say, you talk to me, you open up and let me understand why you feel the way you understand. And I don't think that happens enough. So, no. And so actually the diving festival would, would, would be much more successful if I was able to attract those people. Correct. Because most of the people that go, I mean, they went into it. Oh, oh yeah, you're preaching to the converter. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think there's an element of um, some of the silent majority want to stay silent because they're convinced that what they say would be perceived to be a racist. Right. And what, what I'm saying is the head of the Cultural Awareness Network or just a, a, an, or a decent guy that loves the chat is some of the stuff you will say is racist. Just Let's just own that. Yeah. Some of the stuff that you will say to me will offend me. Let's just own that. <laughs> right. But let's have the conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because if we don't have the conversation... You go back to your dinner table and say what you want. I go back to my dinner table and say what I want, but we don't move forward. Absolutely. So, so when we talk about the, the, the interview process, there's loads of different things like, you know, the blind CVs and the, and the structural differences. Yeah. Do you go into um, helping to write the job specs initially? Because like wording, terminology often pits people off. Yeah, on. I've heard about you know, this. So, tech so, now. So, so, for example, you know, if you're uh, if you're Jamal in Brixton, let's say, mm-hmm. and uh, and you actually quite want to be an underwriter, yeah, and you look at uh, a company website and you see everyone's white and old and whatever it might you know the stereotypes might be, uh, or you read the job spec and it doesn't quite attract you. So I think there's a lot of work that can be done on on that regard. Just even from writing the spec, also the key skills you're looking for. Yeah. So like, looking into that, um, and then the actual interview questions. Yeah, for sure. So is it just like, what football team is for you from Manchester, <laughs> whatever? All Which might be questions. good enough, right? Cause, cause, but the other thing is, like, so when I take feedback from candidates and clients, um, and we do board searches and, and heads of functions and stuff, it's always the first thing anyone always says is, I really feel like I got on well with that person. Oh, wow. I'm like, well, what, what do you mean? Oh, it was just, just a feeling I had. <laughs> and so it's always the, everyone goes on about fit, yeah. cultural fit, and, which is, you know, like, what does that even mean? So, so I'm doing a, a course at the moment at London Business School. Uh, it's like a Lloyd's Leadership course. <clears throat> and our question is around how important is culture for business? What is the role of leaders in culture and how does Lloyd's future-proof its culture for success? And culture is massive at the moment and because it's nebulous. It's so hard to yeah, grasp. Yeah. Um, and does this person fit my culture is so subjective. Um I believe that your culture could be focused around how do I get as many different viewpoints of the world into this place. And at the moment, it's about how do I not mess it up? Yeah, which goes back to people are scared to take a risk. Because, you know, the the whole thing of diversity is diversity enriches. Mm -hmm. You want people with different backgrounds, experiences, and you have more options better decision making, right. all that stuff, but very hard to manage. Uh, well, you know? Like if we have, uh, um, really hard to manage, you know, if you have like a political discussion mm. and you've got- Brexit. Brexit, let's say, right? And you've got people from all over the country, different educational backgrounds, 
um, born in different countries, religious backgrounds, whatever, you're going to have so many different world views and opinions. It's great. Ultimately, you're going to have a massive argument. Yeah, and it's hard, hard to control. Yeah, yeah. But, but you see, so my, uh, where my fiance is from, voted 100% for Brexit. 100% for Brexit? Correct. It's crazy. And what's really interesting about that is um, I have no, I have no um, insight into turnout or anything like that, but they voted 100% Brexit. When I go to this place, there's probably three black people, and when I leave, there are two. It's not a very, it's not a very diverse part of the world, so it's more around that fi- the fear of change. And if you look at the media, and I come back to the media, I think the media has a huge role to play, and we should be forcing media to be more account more accountable for their actions. Oh, yeah. um, they all they saw was images of the jungle migration camp. The day after the vote, jungle migration camp's gone. When's the last time you ever heard of ISIS on the news? Gone. We don't need it anymore. We don't need that as a vehicle to frighten people to no, do what we yeah, want. Yeah. So they'll move on to something else. And now it's all about US and, and China and Russia. So these people kind of made a view. And I'm not saying this has got nothing to do with their education because everyone I've met there is super smart and very entrepreneurial. Um, but they voted 100% Brexit based on fear. And... I believe that we need to challenge that narrative. The other thing I think on, 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 let's say, Brexit is actually, you know, if you think about where most people get their, their news and information from, podcasts, mm-hmm. online, social media, and you had like the Cambridge Analytica stuff, all the Correct. fake news, and so you don't, you don't, half the time you don't know where people are, are learning from. Well, I see a number of copies of The Sun oh, right. up, up, <laughs> up there, and the Daily, and the Daily <laughs> Mail. <laughs> Which, don't get me wrong, if Daily Mail was just showbiz and sport, it'd be the best newspaper in the world, but <laughs> it's all the other stuff that comes with it. And um, um, what I, I guess the point I was driving at with, with, the, with the people that I'm referring to in this particular part of the world is they did this out of fear. Yeah. But if your experience, your day-to-day experience, is never, ever with anybody of colour or anybody from a different background, then you ha- you have no reason to believe that anything's broken so why fix it uh, yeah yeah whereas in london it's different and it, like i look at comic relief like i can't watch comic relief as much as i love lenny henry i can't watch it because the the view of africa hasn't changed since i was a child it's always starving children flies on their face well, skinny Ther- theresa may dance then uh, uh, I mean, i'll was... come to that i've got the best memes <laughs> ever on that with, with skepta in the background but <laughs> but that is the image, and it hasn't shifted. Yeah, no, right? great. Yeah. But when you come to the city of London, talk about Africa, all they talk about is opportunity. Yeah. And money yeah. is to be made there. And that's almost this colonial view of Africa that's not changed. So we'll pump out to the normal people that it's still going through challenge and it, you don't want to go there. Meanwhile, I'm going to go there. I'm going to make a load of money off it. No, I see what you mean, yeah, yeah. It's just, yeah, I mean, Africa is great. The population growth, it's a young, motivated workforce, great technological changes. But yeah, so, so the, the Theresa May thing, um, I was watching, I, I don't know which news channel it was, I was watching on news, and then it was Theresa May dancing. I was like, oh, and they were, I think they were in Joburg or something. And then it panned to the reporter reporting in front of an elephant. I was thinking, hold on a sec, like, there are no elephants like, in Joburg, they're outside Joburg. <laughs> Why are you reporting in front of an elephant? And it was just classic. That's, yeah. that's the image they want you to think of it. Yeah. And we've got to change that. And I think, you know, we, we have a tremendous opportunity um, because we have people that are like minded coming together. And as I said at the start of this, you know, my view of diversity is less about what you look like. And when we were doing our culture project, we spent a long time talking about what the market looks like, because that's a hot topic. But that's not diversity yeah. in my head. Diversity is diversity of ideas, of experience, of skill set. So the opportunity that we have is to create an environment where that comes to the fore and it matters. Yeah. Companies have a humongous opportunity to position it in such a way of, not bring yourself to be- best self to work because it'll make you feel good, even though mental health is a huge issue. Yeah. It's bringing best self to work because we need it 
and that's a different message. Yeah, yeah. That's to solve this problem, we need more people from different viewpoints. Um, you know, I, I look at empathy, I did a, a Myers-Briggs the other day, and my empathy level's very low, <laughs> naturally, because I'm very task-orientated. Okay. Whereas my fiance's empathy level is through the roof as she works in HR. <coughs> Excuse me. So we make quite a good couple, hopefully. I mean, we're getting married next year, so I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, pretty much invested into that. And um, we make a good couple because she approaches things very differently to how I do. And often she'll talk to me about, you know, something at work and I'll say, did you sack them? And she'll be like, no, because of this factor and this factor and this factor. And I'm thinking, what's that got to do with the result? Yeah. But because we have that balance, it works. And that has to happen at, in the office. It has yeah. to happen within the team. It has to happen in your interview process. And you have to actually look to piece together the, a jigsaw. Yeah, yeah. And, and that always changes in under pressure. And you'll know this. When someone says, I need to hire someone, it needs to be done in the next three weeks. That's different to, I need to hire someone in the next six months. Now, just revert back. We've been using technology. Because okay, obviously, there's a big talk about, about automation, AI, and stuff. So, there's some really cool um, apps that have gamified recruitment. So, there's, there's two I know there's Qmetrics, which quite a few big firms use, mm -hmm. um, and then there's NAC. Okay. K N A C K. It's a really right. cool engine firm, okay. and they do they do a lot of work. And so essentially, you, well, with NAC, let's say you um, you decide what attributes you're looking for. So an accountant, you know, like numerical skills, analytical leadership, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, you send the games, the smartphone games, to the to the candidate. They'll mm -hmm. play the games, and then out will pop their NACs. Yeah. And so you'll receive the data, and you'll say, okay, this person, um, you know, is closely aligned with the traits we're looking for. Oh, cool. And then you can invite them for interview. That's a great idea. So it takes away that, you know, blind CV. It's just a nice thing that you can use at some point in the interview process. Um, it shouldn't be to validate the decision you've already made. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it should be either upfront or certainly after stage one. And then something like Qmetrics, they, they do a very similar thing. There's also quite an interesting uh, facial recognition software. Okay. Um, it's called We Are Human, I think. Right. And basically, you send the candidate a video interview. And so it films the person on the smartphone or whatever device you're using. And then it has their live emotions and their live characteristics. And then it would produce a report, personality quote, like personality report, based on facial expressions. And there's some science behind we all have a certain number of facial expressions and, and so forth. You know, we can That's use people's faces. Really I'd love to try that. Really interesting. The, the We Are Human stuff, like the report, wasn't that great, but I'm sure it will get better, so we don't use it, but we mm. will do. And then, I mean, the gamification stuff's a no-brainer. Yeah. I mean, w w one of our private equity for our clients use it, um, a standard for, like, all of their hires. And it's, it's great. It also says quite a lot about the firm if you're using that stuff. And I think it goes a little bit further than just, you know, let's take the names off. Oh, and, 100%. You know. I, I think... You know, to touch on some of the themes we've said today about, you know, equality of opportunity and talking about levelling the playing field, um, recognising people's differences and celebrating them, uh, the interview process, um, backgrounds, media, all of these things. Like you said, if a company can draw a line in the sand and say, like I said with my family brand, yeah. If a company can draw a line in the sand and say, yeah, but this is how we're going to do it. Whether we're 330 years old or we're two years old, this is a statement we're going to make to anyone that joins us from now. I think that's a very powerful, Definitely. powerful statement. And it doesn't just attract young people, it retains the people that you've got. Yeah. Because yeah. it shows that you're willing to make a commitment to change. Um, and, and I think as a, as a person from a black and ethnic minority background, or just someone working in, a, in an industry that's desperate to attract people. It, it, well, it's too proud to say so, but it wants to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, all of that stuff sounds really positive, and it sounds like we're at a, a watershed moment that there's a there's a lot to be positive about. There's a lot to be to be focused on. There's less difference. We're not. I'm not walking into a pub now and people are putting their drinks down like my parents yeah, did. Yeah. I'm walking to a pub where. My best friend's white, and I've got friends in from you know moving to London. I've got friends from India, and I've got friends from China and Japan, and you know all of these different places, Africa, and that's good, and it's, it's celebrated, and it's right, and I I think there's a lot to be 
optimistic about we've yeah. just got to action it I'm, london's the most diverse city around mm -hmm. it's great to be working living here but yeah, all of these things we've talked about if yeah, we just need to crack on i agree just crack on and it happens got to commit to it feels like that's a good place to yeah thank wind you. up thanks a lot thanks for joining me thanks for having me pleasure and we'll do it again yeah definitely cool thank you cheers Hey folks, thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe in all the usual places.